Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thanks for joining the financial statement series of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Nicholas Veron. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce this session where we will uh, talk about the supervisory reform in China. And we're very grateful today to have Meg Ressmeyer uh, on this issue. Uh, Meg is uh, studied first at Emory University, uh, got her degree in international studies and political science there in 2004, and master's in government at Harvard University and her PhD in government uh, in 2011 from Harvard. She has worked uh, since then at the Harvard Business School as an assistant professor of business administration, and then from 2017 as F. Warren McFarlane Associate Professor of Business Administration. Um, Meg has numerous publications, but especially a number of books, one on land bargains and Chinese capitalism, the politics of property rights under reform, uh, 2015. Uh, then uh, with co-authors The State and Capitalism in China, where she uh, got established as one of the leading scholars on the uh, corporate governance and uh, business dynamics uh, in the current Chinese system. Uh, and most recently, Precarious Ties, Business and the State in Authoritarian Asia. Let me do some advertising here because it's really a fascinating book looking at the interplay between uh, business elites and political elites, not just in China, but also for comparative purposes in Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, very illuminating uh, way to look at the transformations of the Chinese uh, business scene. Yeling Tan uh, is not a newcomer to the series. Uh, she uh, studied at uh, Stanford in uh, international relations and uh, economics uh, back in 2002. She was a Tom Ford Fellow at the Asia Foundation. She uh, then worked in Singapore at the Ministry of Defense, serving on the Indonesia desk and then as head of the U.S. desk in the 2000s. Uh, she has also been a research fellow at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Governance in Singapore, a consultant for the World Bank. And then she came back to the U.S. at Harvard Kennedy School uh, in uh, and got a degree, uh, an MPA ID, sorry, a uh, master's degree uh, at the Kennedy School in 2011, and then her PhD in public policy in 2017. She has spent some time uh, in visiting fellowships at Peking University, at Tsinghua University. She was a postdoc fellow at Princeton done in 2017 and 18 and in 2018 she joined the University of Oregon as assistant professor of political science uh, and uh, more recently I think just uh, January this year right healing uh, at Oxford uh, University at the Blavat Nick School of Government, where she is a professor of public policy. But of course, most importantly, in 2022, she joined the Peterson Institute for International Economics as a non-resident senior fellow and is a, 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 a very important member of the China team uh, at Peterson. So with that, Meg, over to you. Great. Thank you, Nicholas, for having me. And thank you, Ya Ling, um, for her generous time today to talk about this. It should be a really interesting conversation. Um, so I've been given strict instructions to stick to uh, 10 minutes um, this morning for an initial presentation. And so that's what I'm going to do. Um, and so let me do my best to keep that time so we have plenty of time to discuss um, and maybe even argue among the three of us. You two certainly know plenty about these recent reforms. Um, so what we've experienced over what I would really say is the last 10 or 12 years in China is a breakdown of China's financial regulatory system and a crackdown. And what we're seeing now is an attempt to reestablish party state control over that financial regulatory architecture. And so you see a basic timeline of that here. Um, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis after 2008, we saw a huge stimulus um, within the People's Republic of China, the PRC, which led to a significant amount of overinvestment in that economy in both infrastructure, real estate development, um, as well as kind of local government investment in, in infrastructure and public goods. In fact, the best, um, the best data I can give on that is that at, at that point in 2010 and 2011, investment to GDP was around 45% in China overall, almost 50% in many parts of China, including places like Chongqing or other provinces, which is the highest investment to GDP number we've ever seen for any country for which we have data ever. And this, of course, led to a significant amount of debt, since much of that stimulus came not from direct um, 
capital infusion, but rather from kind of the political exhortation on the part of the central government telling banks you should lend, lend to SOEs, lend to developers. And so it was really a debt fueled stimulus rather than a finance channel or um, fiscal channel stimulus, which led to this significant debt dynamics that we're seeing um, kind of come to roost in the last several years. So in 2013 and 2014, which I'll remind all the listeners was still the beginning of Xi Jinping's term, the idea was to shift a lot of that investment from real estate and from infrastructure into equity markets, right? Allowing firms to access capital. And so we saw a huge movement into equity markets and also a push to lend that capital outwards, both in terms of lending through programs like the Belt and Road and also outward direct investment um, through similar programs, as well as the activities that were uncoordinated of private firms. In 2015, 2016, we saw an equity market crisis in China, which I'll say more about which in the wake of that equity market crisis in 2016, financial regulators started to talk about a debt crisis, started to talk about systemic risks, not only in terms of local government debt, which we've heard a lot about that comes through the land finance channel, but also corporate debt. Um, And so you start to see language about gray rhinos, iceberg type um, threats where you can only see the top of of the actual extent of corporate debt or local government debt in crisis uh, or or local government debt extent. And then from 2016 to the present, note that I don't say 2023, I don't say 2020, but it's really 2016 to the present. We see that breakdown in the financial sector and the crackdown. Where we are now, and you can see Xi Jinping here at the Central Financial, um, the Central Financial Commission, the new party body that was created in 2023 last year um, to deal with the financial sector. At the center of this meeting, where he's mostly surrounded himself with people who are very loyal to him, some of whom have technocratic backgrounds in financial governance, but all of whom come through a party and loyalty channel, and so this re-centralization of party control. So I'm going to make basically three points in the next few minutes. Um, One point is to ask the question and answer part of the question, what's the impetus for this overhaul of the financial regulatory system? Two past episodes that may or may not shed light on what's happening now and what's likely to happen. And also, I'll end with provocatively, I hope, what I think is an unprecedented uh, unprecedented challenge on the part of the CCP. So briefly, just to give a preview, what's the impetus is that over the last... 15 years, really, the combination of financial malfeasance, um, extensive corruption, and debt risks have convinced CCP leaders that neither business nor technocrats or bureaucrats can discipline financial markets, nor can they really be disciplined by financial markets, and they require party discipline. My argument is that actually they're mostly correct, that these these groups cannot be well-disciplined within within the context of China's Um, financial regulatory structure. Um, And so in some ways, they're responding to not some ideology or not some imagined problem within the financial sector, but very real challenges that have presented these systemic risks. There are two past episodes that I want to cover. And so this moment of extra institutional reorganization of the financial system. So creating a new institution and overhauling the extant system is not the first time that this has happened. It happened in the late 1990s through 2005. Um, And that particular episode gives us some equipment to understand what's happening now, but there are limits to that analogy. Rather, how the party state dealt with the 2015-2016 stock market crisis, I think tells us a lot more. Lastly, what's the unprecedented challenge? The question is, can China have a modern financial system that efficiently allocates capital with a closed political system? You'll see that my answer to that is likely no. All right, so what was the old financial system? Very briefly, it was called Yihang Sanhui, one bank in three systems. So the People's Bank of China was the central bank, it still is the central bank, um, and, and sets policy over monetary policy. And then you have three regulatory commissions that curiously for the last several years before this overhaul were relatively siloed. So the, the, the China Securities Regulatory Commission, the Banking Regulatory Commission, and the Insurance Regulatory Commission each had their own systems of allocating licenses um, and dealing with risk right within those different arenas, and they didn't talk to one another much, which becomes very relevant after the 2015-2016 crisis. During this period, which was really 2003 to 2023 or to 2017, um, the focus was on bureaucratization as well as the financialization of SOE management. 
So a lot of the creation of the modern financial system comes from the desire to have state-owned enterprises in China removed from kind of local control or ministerial control and instead have them amalgamated into the state administration um, system, right, uh, where, where, whereby many of these SOEs, especially the central SOEs, themselves listed on stock markets. And we see the governance of them go through the financial sector, ideally through both shareholders as well as regulators. But the impetus is why, you know, why did China even expand its financial system, especially the equity system, right, was partly to reconfigure state control over state-owned enterprises. What we have now in this new financial regulatory structure is some formal changes and some informal changes. So the formally, we saw first in 2018, um, the China Insurance Regulatory Commission and Banking Regulatory Commission were merged into the China Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission for about five years, from 2018 to 2023. That commission was dissolved in 2023 when um, and, and during that process, right, we see this Financial Stability and Development Committee from 2017 to 2023, chaired by Xi Jinping himself, um, which was in charge of kind of trying to imagine a new way to govern the Chinese financial system. A lot of this coming again on the heels of 2015 through 2017, this massive equities market crisis during which the extent of, uh, of both corporate and local government debt became alarming to party officials. The 2015 national security law listed financial stability as a core pillar of national security in China. And the result of, the, of this committee was the creation of the Central Financial Commission um, in 2023, which is a party committee um, whose chairman has the ministerial rank, right, um, designed to, to have complete control and party control um, over the financial regulatory architecture. And then a government administration, right, the National Financial Regulation Administration, which also started in 2023. The chairman is the Minister of Finance, and that's kind of on the state side of regulating all three sectors of the financial system, so securities, insurance, and banking. What the formal changes don't necessarily tell you is, is that there are basically three pillars to how the CCP is now governing the financial system. The first is I observe that it's the state coercive apparatus. So the Central Commission on Disciplinary Inspection, the CCDI, as well as arrests that are dealing with regulators and market participants who behave in ways that are really sometimes illegal, but also just inefficient. So instead of letting markets discipline those people, we see the state disciplining those people through, again, its coercive apparatus. Second, the emphasis is on party monitoring and party control as a source of discipline. Again, that does trade off with market discipline. And lastly, we see the massive rise of state shareholding. So the, the, the presence of the party state itself as a minority shareholder in many different types of companies in China, including ones that are not formally state owned. What's the impetus for this? So very briefly and colorfully, um, these are four um, sort of tycoons of different flavors in China, all of whom have had different fates over the last 10 years. Um, so I'm not gonna go through all of them for the sake of time, but certainly the man on the top right is very familiar to most people who have worked on China or who are familiar with China's uh, financial sector, Sao Jianhua, who was the former banker to the party, um, who was wanted for years, was kind of kidnapped from Hong Kong in 2017, finally sentenced in the summer of 2022. Um, we all know Guo Wenguei, Miles Kwok, who's been in the United States for some time in exile in New York City. Um, and on the bottom right, we see Guo Guangchang, a Fu Sun, a company that ha he, where, a company that has been kind of under investigation on and off since 2016. He's been detained several times, but kind of caught and released and still allowed to run his system. Why do we see, starting in 2015, this catch and release and sometimes catch and prosecute um, kind of approach to these different tycoons in China? A lot of it is because, indeed, many companies in China, both private and public, were using their access to the financial system to enrich themselves at the expense of society. So you see here um, the founding of the China Minsheng Investment Group, Zhong Mintou, which was designated by Li Keqiang and formed by him and had, you know, Zhong, it was a private company that was run by private entrepreneurs um, that had their private capital invested, but it had the Zhongguo, the China at the very beginning, which gave it the imprimatur of the state. And indeed, it was formed at Li Keqiang's insistence to be the JP Morgan of China. So to be a, a kind of investment bank that would allocate resources efficiently in China's private sector to assist with industrial upgrading. 
But within several years, many of the people who indeed had their own money invested in this company had been had done such extensive self dealing that the company went into receivership with hundreds of billions of dollars of renminbi in debt. And almost all of these people, right, were unceremoniously fired, but not necessarily arrested um, by government officials. We've also seen populist outcry in China, um, as well as protests, right, over what Lucy Hornby has called financial democratization and the, its discontents, right? So we see the P2P lending episode that happened in the mid 20 teens resulted in a lot of fraud and founders of these platforms absconding, um, angry investors breaching Evergrande's headquarters, right, um, in the last two years. And so this idea that expanding the financial sector and democratizing it did not necessarily work either for financial stability or for social stability. Just briefly, and um, Nicholas was very kind to plug my book. <laughs> so this, these, these figures appear in the book. Um, and so I did a bunch of research on these, these big conglomerates in China. So you see H&A, Hainan Hong Kong on the left, Wanda, which in the last few weeks has been, well, in the last few years has been unwinding many of its positions, has extensive debt, has been restructured just a little bit in the last few weeks. Um, and we see, you know, the extent to which the borrowings of these companies were so deeply dispersed, right? So I had to uncover this through prospectus filings and through almost forensic work and corporate filings to figure out how many subsidiaries these companies have. It turns out to be thousands for each of them. And they're borrowing under different licenses from so many different banks and securities organizations, including state ones, but also private ones, in ways where it, the, the regulators themselves thought they just did not have a view into the extent of financial activity on the part of the private sector, not just the public sector. So briefly, you know, what's the problem with all of this? Right here you have Xiang Junbo, who was the chairman of the China Insurance Regulatory Commission um, for much of the 20 teens. He was accused of expanding licenses in exchange for bribes, um, especially tied to Anbang, a company that was nationalized in early 2018. And the view and the language we hear over and over again is that people like this, regulators like this, had colluded with financial predators who were hunting officials. And these officials were quite vulnerable because they were sort of in a, a no man's land of the party state hierarchy where they were neither going to advance very significantly within the party state, nor did they have kind of a rule of law and open transparency that would govern their actions. So the CCP leadership again became convinced that markets and regulations alone cannot discipline financial actors. Again, they might be right. Um, why might they be right? Well, China has basically three features of its political economy um, that I would argue are very hard to change. So one is short time horizons, and I'm going to come back to that at the end of the presentation. The second is a dual regulatory system whereby they want state-owned enterprises, right, to be able to list and, and, and collect equity and collect share, you know, and have minority shareholders. Although that's basically a fiction that these minority shareholders would actually be able to have rights and govern, right, the companies that they own shares in. And so it's very difficult to have half of your stock market operating by the state-owned enterprise logic where it's not subject to market oversight and minority shareholder protection, and then say the other half have to be subject to all of these disciplines. And so this dual regulatory system leaves this open space through which even private sector actors can manipulate the financial system to their own benefit. And lastly, quite clearly and relatedly, China has a lack of transparency and a lack of rule of law, which is very difficult to have with a modern financial se sector that's expanded as rapidly as China has. All right, so in the last couple minutes, I wanna talk about basically these two episodes. So, and just to go through this quickly, as I said, this is not the first time we've seen such an overhaul in China. So in 1997, in the wake of the Asian financial crisis and cycles of debt and inflation in the 1990s and SOE reform, there, we, basically Zhu Rongji created um, the Central Financial Work Commission, which looked very similar to the Central Financial Commission in terms of who staffed it, what kind of rank they had, and how it was this extra institutional solution to overhauling the, uh, the governance of the private sector. And so the, Zhu Rongji creates this organization, which is trying to kind of lift control out of local banking organizations or local governments, as well as departmental kind of control to try to suppress the extent to which lending was political, right? So these inflation crises that were perennial because of the structure of China's financial system and the lack of market discipline for political actors or for market actors. 
What's very interesting. So then Wen Jiabao, when when he came to power, um, along hey, with Hu Jintao. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, you want me to wrap I, up? I, I think uh, I want to hear about the 2015 crisis. So I think okay. we may skip the details of uh, okay. the late 90s, even so it's super interesting okay. uh, so that we have time to discuss. Sure. Let me skip that quickly and then go to the tw 2015 crisis. So the, the punchline was going to be that, in fact, the reorganization under Wen Jiabao, which led to this departization, was very different, actually, than what's going on now. And actually, the 2015 crisis tells us more. So again, what happened is 2013 to 2014, there's a push into equity markets. We get the encouragement of equity market growth with extensive margin lending from major brokerage houses in China. All of these financial innovations, like the P2P platforms, as well as using housing as collateral to borrow to invest in equities markets, different kinds of technology platforms platforms that allowed kind of a hierarchical management of retail investors in the Chinese stock market all ends in a kind of crisis, right? So we see in 2015, um, in the summer, you know, immediately there's a kind of burst in the bubble. And initially the CSRC says this is an appropriate market correction. And then everyone hears that and says, oh, well, they're not going to prop up prices, so I'm going to pull out even more money. And so things slide even quicker. And then after a few days, they say this market correction is too rapid. Then we saw the intervention um, of what's called the Guo Gui, the national team, which bought 1.3 trillion worth of equities at that moment. Those positions have not been unwound. Um, I don't have the slides here to show that, but I have a paper on that where basically you see the rise of these central shareholding vehicles and the extent to which they're still invested in minority positions in the vast majority of listed firms in Shenzhen and Shanghai. What are we seeing now? Basically a repetition of that, right? So the idea that it's only state intervention that can prop up prices. And so this intolerance of market discipline and instability, right, leads to state intervention, which my argument would be leads to a lot more gaming, right, and speculation based on what the state's going to do and its own intolerance of market discipline rather than allocating capital efficiently. So let me just conclude um, on that note <laughs> by arguing that what China's doing right now is really addressing an unprecedented challenge and one that I would say we've never seen before, um, which is trying to grow through innovation and consumption at a next stage, and it requires a financial sector. So let me just go back one, one you know, <laughs> let's say generation to ask, how did China grow without requisite institutions for so long? We have a lot of ink spilled over this question, right? No one expected a Leninist party state without formal property rights and without political openness, right, to grow at the rates that China did. We know two things. One, that it had a private sector that was willing to take risks. And second, that it had certain endowments like its population, which was skilled and educated, and also a favorable external environment. So the ability to export right to global markets and also frankly to extract bargains from foreign direct investors that smaller countries without the promise of China's market wouldn't be able to do. There's a really interesting debate right now in the field of political economy of China about whether the CCP should be credited with any of this growth at all, or whether it was it just basically not financial policy making or economic policy making, but just the liberation of markets. And that debate has been going on for decades, but has been renewed given the current um, market slowdown in China. But the next stage requires something different. If you want to go through innovation and consumption rather than investments and exports, right, it's going to require a financial sector. And modern financial sectors, which no doubt everyone listening here knows, <laughs> require trust. They require accountability. They require transparency and an impartial, right, enforcement of rules. And China seems unwilling to have that. So the irony is that by concentrating even more power in parties to kind of control and discipline over the private sector and over the financial sector, right, it's a step away from allowing markets to do that and allowing people to trust that markets will discipline investors and that markets will efficiently allocate institutions. And so my argument would be that China is going to be further trapped in this kind of cat and mouse game of refusing to allow markets to work and refusing to tolerate instability and then teaching financial market participants that the real opportunities are in arbitraging what they think state support will be and what the state will and will not tolerate. And that's not necessarily um, a solution to this problem of wanting to efficiently allocate capital in a, through a financial sector that seems modern. 
Um, so I will stop there <laughs> and, um, and, and eagerly await Yelling's response and the discussion. That was masterful, uh, Yelling. Thanks so much, Nicola, and thanks, Meg. Uh, so much to unpack and so much to think about. I wanted to pick up um, on one of your latter points on the past being prologue and highlight a few of the new features of the Central Financial Commission, this new regulatory structure that has been stood up. Um, and then maybe at the end, get your thoughts <clears throat> on how effective it's all going to be uh, so that you can elaborate a little bit on your conclusion. So what's new about this new um, about this newly restructured financial system compared to the 1990s, right? As Meg pointed out, this has been tried before in the late 1990s with Jerome Z's Central Financial Work Commission. Well, what's new is that firstly, there's not only a re-establishment of the Work Commission, but the establishment of a new financial commission with much greater powers, right? And we can see this in, in um, an elevation of authority. Whereas in the 1990s, it was Wen Jiabao as vice premier, who was secretary of the work commission. Now we have the premier, Li Qiang, as the secretary of the commission, right. and He Lifeng as vice premier is the director of the general office, right? The right. new financial commission also has a lot more authority over regulatory content. Whereas in the 1990s, the work commission was mostly focused on personnel and, right. um, uh, and, and establishing greater discipline over personnel. So this shift in authority is new. We also have a lot more emphasis on ideological discipline in, in this financial commission. Whereas the late 1990s, we had the financial commission, the work commission under Zhu Rongji being set up in the midst of Zhuo Da Fangxia, right? In the midst of mm -hmm. SOE restructuring, in the midst of trying to establish greater space for the private sector. Um, and in the midst of the buildup to the three represents, here we have the new financial commission emphasizing uh, discipline, right? And emphasizing ideological loyalty, messaging from the party central on how finance needs to serve the real economy, right? And not right. move into disorderly ways, right? To build what China calls high quality development in service of what it calls the new development model. Right. And the third new element I would, I would um, highlight is securitization. Right. So since, uh, you know, with the latest five year plan that came out a couple of years ago with the 20th Party Congress, the emphasis on coordinating uh, security and development um, is overarching. And the Financial Work Conference last November also emphasized security several times, the need to balance financial opening and security. So we have these new elements, right? Higher authority, greater emphasis on ideological discipline and um, securitization. So as you pointed out, right, there's there's some very real concrete reasons for this restructuring to happen. Uh, regulatory arbitrage, corruption, bureaucratic, bureaucratic fragmentation. So now just to loop back to where you ended off, will it work, right? As you pointed out, some of these tensions that um, drove the corruption and drove financial malfunction actually have not been resolved no. because underneath the formal restructuring are informal methods of control that are longstanding. And in, in these informal methods of control, in, in particular personnel control, there are unresolved tensions. So if you have the organization department continuing to um, basically exert personnel control over who, who leads each of these financial institutions, who leads your state-owned banks and so on, your financial leaders, leaders of these various organizations are ultimately accountable to the party and not to the organization that they lead, right? This is longstanding. It hasn't been resolved by the restructuring. And we could argue perhaps these misaligned incentives have been exacerbated by the stronger exertion um, of, the, of the party uh, central committee. So those questions need to be um, whether or not these, these misaligned incentives will continue to drive uh, undesirable outcomes, right? I, I think that right. remains to be seen because the restructuring is quite new. Alongside that, we also have new tensions, right? This proliferation of goals as China's economy has become so complex and the problems are multiplying. So on top of serving the real economy, this financial commission is also seeking to, or a task with, risk prevention and control with driving innovation, 
with driving the rule of law, with driving structural reform, with balancing, as I pointed out earlier, security and openness. How in concrete terms will this commission be able to do all of that, right? How in concrete terms do we uh, liberalize um, the financial system, build out rule of law and drive innovation and and, um, protect security? I think all of these, because the commission is so new, uh, remains to be seen how effective it is. You've pointed right. out these big structural issues, right? That it's China's unprecedented um, challenge. So I, I kind of want to end off there. And perhaps uh, if you have time to to discuss, you know, how is China's current approach to dealing with the pressures on the stock market today under this new commission? Is it is it similar to, or is it different from the 2015? crisis and I'll yeah. stop there. Those Thanks are a lot of much. great points. And um, thank you, Yelling. That's great. And um, yeah, a lot of what, you know, I think when we compare that moment from the 19, late 90s to the early 2000s to the present, it's in some ways similar, in some ways the absolute opposite, right? So under Wen Jiabao, it was the retreat of the party in favor, right, of the bureaucratization of the state, right? And instead, now we have the kind of massive institutionalization of the Central Financial Commission, which, you know, there was a a big debate in the early 2000s, you know, is is the Central Financial Work Commission a shadow central bank? Well, now it really does look like we we might think of, I mean, it's just a hypothesis, the Central Financial Commission is a shadow central bank. We've seen just in an informal way, the hollowing out of the traditional monetary authorities in China. So there's been a lot of, you know, um, uh, kind of crackdowns and prosecutions of regulators. Wu Daoko, the traditional kind of feeder into the central bank, has been marginalized in many ways within Beijing. And so now we have this new huge right concentration of the authority there rather than, you know, you have a work commission that reorganizes things and then retreats in favor of the institutionalization of a new bureaucracy. Instead, we see the institutionalization of the financial commission itself. Um, what's also different about it is that the problems of the late 1990s and early 2000s were on the state side. So it was, you know, as you said, Zhuo Da Feng Shao, the release the large, and, or I'm sorry, release the small and grasp the large. So SOE, privatization and reform, non-performing loan crisis was on the state sector. What's super interesting in China over the last 10 years is that the corporate debt is in the private sector as well as in the state sector, right? So you have massive private sector firms that are deeply indebted. And, you know, people have focused on real estate side firms, but it's not just the real estate crisis, right? It's a lot of companies, I mentioned Short Time Horizons, who basically saw this financial opening and thought it's time to borrow as much as I can while the borrowing is good. And then we saw, you know, my my book is about this, but we saw a massive amount of asset expatriation and capital flight from China, not just in the last two years, but in the last 10 years, right? So a lot of what looked like Belt and Road outward investment was investment in real estate and in secure assets in, you know, North America and in Europe on the part of these firms. And the regulators started to say in 2016, look, these people are not on our side. So this distrust is still there. And what's super interesting, just to give kind of credit where credit's due to an earlier generation of research on this, when you read, right, um, Sebastian Heilman's work on the 2000, or the, the, the Central Financial Work Commission, or Margaret Pearson's work on, on regulators and bureaucrats, right, both of them sort of conclude, this is in, in 2005, look, these incentives aren't compatible with the career incentives of bureaucrats within the CCP, right? They don't know how to balance these different things. They don't know how to, uh, you know, make decisions based on efficiency. And they're, in, in Margaret Pearson's words, neither here nor there within the party state hierarchy. And both of them sort of predict, predicted that financial regulation couldn't work this way. And they were right, right? Um, and so the real question then is, you know, how will they balance things like innovation? I mean, as you said, you put it really well in the future. I have to say, given the emphasis on party control, I'm a little pessimistic about that um, because what we see, I, I don't know, Nicholas, you you probably have views on this too. Well, um, I mean, but... you're, 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 you're painting a very compelling uh, picture of a disaster zone here. So basically, uh, uh, there, is, there is no positive elements that emerge from either of your two uh, accounts. Uh, before we get back to this, I would like to go a little bit back to the specifics of what's happening, uh, because, uh, because because that's uh, important. And uh, 
I think I'm not the only one uh, in the audience uh, needing a little bit more of, um, of uh, you know, the details. So we have two organizations now. We have the Central Financial Commission, which is chaired by Li Qian, correct? Mm -hmm. That's uh, right. And we have the National Administration for Financial Regulation, which is subordinate right. to the CFC and is led or chaired by the finance minister, Lan Fo An, or... Uh, right. Uh, so neither of these two organizations is led by a full-time financial regulator, correct? That's right. So if, if we ask now, who's the top financial regulator in China? The answer is, well, probably some of the deputies to those politicians, right? Without a clear answer. Without a clear answer, right. And so, I mean, what's interesting about Zhu Rongji was that he did have this background, right? And he was he was very focused on the financial sector. And then, right. and we've seen a cycle of, you know, chair people of the CSRC and the People's Bank, all of whom keep going down in these corru corruption scandals. And so, yes, it's I on mean, the political the, side. In the previous yeah. era, uh, I had the impression that the chair of the CBIRC, so the Consolidated Banking and Insurance uh, yeah. Supervisor, was Guo Xuqin, and he mm -hmm. had clout as the party secretary of the People's Bank of China. So, right. in a way, my question, who is the top financial regulator, had at least a tentative answer with Guo Xuqin, but that figure has completely disappeared into the current organization, correct? That seems to me to be right, yes. Uh, which, to me, is completely fascinating in terms of, you know, thinking of... I wouldn't dare say independence, but even accountability uh, of financial regulatory organizations and, uh, and and thinking about their success or failure. Another thing you mentioned, uh, Meg, is that the problem in the previous uh, organization was that uh, financial regulators were in a kind of no man's land where they had neither real um, party cloud nor, uh, you know, um, what was your other element? Uh, was it remuneration or... Well, you, well, uh, definitely remuneration, but also, I mean, when we think about, you know, who staffs the SEC, you know, they have kind of a professional mentality, exactly. right, of, and, exactly. and, and, and so, clear, you know, clear incentives and clear kind of limits on, on what their authority might and, be. And, and it seems to me that in the new organizations, they're... Uh, Unless I'm mistaken, and I, uh, I I take that also from my colleague at Peterson, Martin Schrozempa, mm -hmm. all their uh, remunerations have been cut very significantly. So they're earning significantly less money than they used to, which is professionally demeaning. And also right. in terms of party rank, um, we have now, we know we have uh, the... the Financial technocrats in the system have been demoted in party rank, not That's promoted right. in the reorganization. So it, it looks like applying your lands of the no man's land, uh, they're even farther into wilderness now, correct? It's gotten worse. Yeah. And I do remember when the salaries were cut, you know, at the People's Bank and elsewhere, it was a huge amount of demoralization within a kind of a core of people who saw themselves as internationally trained, who saw themselves as, you know, technocratic and apolitical in some ways. But then the irony is, and it's very interesting, because in, in 2015, 2016, when they start talking about the financial predation and being hunted, a lot of it is, oh, well, you know, these these kinds of regulators the, with this expertise, they can make a lot more money in the private sector. So there's a revolving door. But then if you have their salaries, it seems to me it gets even worse, actually. Um, and so the idea then is to replace kind of either, you know, financial incentives or remuneration or replace kind of bureaucratic, you know, the idea under Wen Jiabao was that these people can be bureaucratized. It's a professional bureaucracy. But, you know, there's not really a huge system of accountability and rule of law. And you still have this concentration of control, right, within the party state over key resources. And so you get corruption, which is not exactly surprising. And then now the answer to that, just to be clear, is that it's the party that will control people, right? And so as long as the party itself has discipline, it doesn't matter if you're either neither here nor there, right? Because you're a party person who's controlled by the party um, right. rather so than a, the state kind of, side. I mean, yeah. it's it's a, re, a replay of the old Maoist uh, struggle between the expert and the red, and now the, the reds are winning in the financial sector. Is that just, is that a fair summary? I think that seems right to me. I mean, the only thing I would say about it, Yelling had, you know, some interesting things to say about ideological discipline. And I would say the the thing I always like to emphasize is it's not really as much about ideology as it is about discipline, right? It's not as if they're really red because they believe in communism and they believe I'm sure, in... Sure part of the uh, Yelling, uh, uh, do you agree with all that? I mean, is, there, is it really that stark or is there a saving grace here? I mean, I think we 
there I, I like that you're you're urging us to to you know um consider the other side of the coin. It is true that this commission was stood up just months ago, right? And so I think a lot of the personnel changes are still happening. Uh, how the commission will will behave is something that we're you know we're all watching. Markets are are all watching, but based based on what we can learn from history and just drawing from the party's efforts to experiment with these various ways of governing, right? You delegate entirely to the state. Well, that didn't work, right? Um, and there's a broader fear of delegating entirely to the market because of this fear of a uh, you know um, what the party calls the disorderly expansion of um, capital. And so now the party seems to be moving back to the solution of, well, then we need to exert control. And so what we had earlier, a clear division between who is a technocrat and who um, who is a party leader, right? If the party, what is the role of the party? Is it primarily to focus on propaganda, discipline, and personnel? Or does it also manage the content of, of um, financial governance, right? Now the party's answer is we do we do both, right? And so the role for the technocrats has now been shrunk to merely being implementers. So, it, well, it, you know, on, on, is that on, going to work? On, on is, this, you know, yeah, that's not really a saving grace. Um, on this last point. My understanding is that the Central uh, Financial Commission is being staffed with technocrats as well as party hacks, right? So oh, do, we, yeah. do we have a sense of what, I mean, first, how big is it, frankly, uh, and what the division of labor was between the CFC and the NAFA, the, 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 the party commission and the national administration, uh, is the NAFA completely subordinate to the CFC or is it more complicated? Uh, but maybe more importantly, what is, what is the balance in the CFC between the technocratic types and the party types? Or has this uh, question completely lost any meaning? No, I don't think it's lost meaning. Um, and I mean, I, and I'm not the specialist on elite politics, right? You'll have, you should have other people on to tell you, oh, this person has this background and that background. That's not really my area, right? Like, um, I mean, but we know, you know, Li Chiang has a lot of credibility, actually, from his experience in Shanghai and has some kind of you know, a lot of people think actually he he's a little more open to reform than some people may 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 think he might be, but I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, but there are people on the Central Financial Commission who do have those backgrounds. There's a great piece in the China Leadership Monitor which breaks down right who each person is and how big it is. You're, I mean, on on what's subordinate to what we don't know yet because all of this is very new, right? Just as if, I mean, it's it's clear. You know, what what I wanted to emphasize is there's been a lot of instability in this. Like first the consolidation. I can, can I challenge this? It's been announced a year ago, so we should know a little bit now. Well, it I was don't announced know. a year ago, but the timeline to actually execute the restructuring was one year. Yeah. Right. And then we so had. Now is when um, we should see things percolating. <laughs> uh, Lauren, Lauren Gladman has a question on. Um, sure. Yeah, it on, was just March on, last year, so it's, it's going to take a while. Can, how, can we expect to learn more about the respective rules, or will it be uh, indefinitely shrouded in secrecy the, the, between the different bodies? They've been issuing, you know, reports on what they're meant to do. I mean, a lot of it is just you know, what we call in Chinese, Beihua, you know, party discipline, blah, 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 right, this kind of stuff. And so in terms of clear rules, and I saw someone else asked about accounting rules, you know, you wanted something positive to say. You know, I do think this interesting episode between the U.S. and China where the U.S. was saying they're going to delist all of these firms, right? And then instead there was an agreement to have international accounting firms provide international accounting standards. That's okay. a kind of... Which frankly was a capitulation was the, by the Chinese side. I mean, the Chinese accepted yes, what the, what the exactly. U.S. had been asking for, uh, you know, for more than a decade. Yeah, don't tell them it was a capitulation because I think it's such yeah, a sorry. good outcome. Tell them it's a great compromise um, and that basically, you know, that there was a win for them because then Chinese companies were able to stay listed in international markets. And But that's the kind of thing where when there's pressure for more accountability, right, where does that come from? And so that's one direction where it came from there. You know, my guess is given the ups and downs, right, Chinese investors really want to see that kind of accountability within China, but it's going to take a different 
it takes a different division of authority, right? Um, and to, back to Stefan Ingvar's question on accounting. Yeah. Um, my understanding had been that the CSRC, the Securities Regulatory Commission, right. was in charge of accounting enforcement and of uh, audit oversight with some division Correct. of labor that I never fully understood with, between the CSRC Correct. and the Ministry of Finance. Now, okay. in the reform, it has been uh, announced that the CSRC would continue to exist, but that its investor protection uh, duties would be transferred to the new National Administration of, right. uh, of uh, Financial Regulation, which um, to me raises the question of what, what is left of a securities regulator when you take away the investor protection bit. Uh, so, so do you know a little bit of what the division of labor or is that still too fuzzy? It's too fuzzy for me. I'm not enough in detail on exactly what that looks like right now. So I'm not the person to ask on that. And, and I haven't really actually seen anyone writing on that that knows about it yet. So it's not quite clear. It seems to be very uh, nebulous still. Yeah, so. Do you have any insight on that one? No, I mean, on just building off of the conversation, I would say that the where we're circling around is where does where does market credibility come from, right? It's I, I would I think it's it's completely fair to say that in the new commission it will be it is and is and will be staffed with highly capable technocrats who 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 know their work. They they are housed within the Central Financial Commission. So what is the signal being sent to the private sector and to investors, right? Are I think the message that the party wants to project is that it is disciplined. And it is at the same time technocratically well equipped, right? But I think what's being read by market participants is a sense of confusion, right? Is it the party talking or is it the technocrats talking? Because now they're fused into the same body, right? Is it security or or is it development? I think that's where there remains um, a whole lot of confusion that we're trying to uh, that we're talking about right now. Oh, and yeah. ironically, just yeah. to add to that, no, I mean, ironically, the interesting thing is, I think if if in, if in 2017, they had just let the, the market correct itself, they wouldn't have been in this big mess, right? Where there's this huge That's infusion cool. of state cap capital, which, you know, just generates counterparties, which just generates arbitrage opportunities, and then they have to crack down on the members of the national team who did the self-dealing and who were doing insider trading. And the result is like, as Yelling is, is hinting at, investors don't know where the discipline is coming from. Is the discipline going to come from markets or not? And the answer seems to be no, it's going to come from the party. And that's why I think when we think about what's different between 2015 and now, 2015 was a bubble that was driven by the party state saying, invest in stock markets, everything's going to be fine. And now I think it's a more genuine sentiment problem where people are saying, my, my, my estimation of the value of, of, of a future share in most of these companies is much lower than what it is now. And there's no answer to that other than more investment from the state, which everyone thinks will just generate more arbitrage opportunities. I'm, I'm again uh, trying to find a bright side here. I'm struggling. Yeah. Uh, Martin Shorzempa is asking whether uh, there might be an advantage in the new architecture in and anyway, you hinted at that, Meg, by saying the three commissions were silos. So so will we gain in terms of flexibility to address new uh, issues? Uh, FinTech, of course, comes to mind. Uh, Chris Schenker is asking about the shadow banking sector. Will this mm -hmm. new integrated regulator yeah. be better at addressing the shadow banks, um, whatever that means, uh, than, um, than uh, uh, the, the former architecture? Is that a plus or is that actually going to create more dysfunction because there will be turf war within the integrated regulator, which will be less easy to uh, adjudicate than uh, differences between specialized regulators. How do you think about that? Well, th that's a lot of um, that's a lot of prediction that I'm not comfortable doing. I will say one thing. I do think the shadow banking issue, so this this issue of like extensive systemic risk, the iceberg type risk, there is kind of a, a, a really serious move to attack that. And part of what I was trying to say- Sorry, what, uh, What's on the, the difference between, uh, uh, for my education, between extensive and iceberg? What's, uh, what's the concept? Well, it's the same. So the, the iceberg concept is that actually, you know, these companies, which you think 
you know, they have a couple listed vehicles, big conglomerate firms, and you think that they have this amount of debt. But actually, once you look at the extent of all of their investments and all, and, I mean, they do all kinds of stuff that your listeners know well. They do tunneling, you know, they list a one vehicle and then shift its assets to another vehicle, et cetera. So one, so one right thing is, and, and when I'm saying they're responding to real problems, so the separation, the siloed, you know, banking, insurance, securities, right, that, that actually left huge gaps where you have, you know, like, the, like tomorrow, but tomorrow group and Baosheng Bank, right, under Sao Jianhua, they had licenses in insurance, licenses in securities, licenses in banking. And so the unification of that does, I think, allow a lot more supervision where you won't, you won't see the emergence of things like Hainan, Hong Kong, Anbang, right, these big conglomerates conglomerates that were indebted in different ways. So the iceberg idea, according to Chinese regulators, is that you can only see the tip of something that looks bad, but actually below the surface, it's even worse. And you can't see it as you're sailing. And then you've got to expose these systemic risks. And so, you know, there are two futures, right? And this is very blunt, but one is a future in which there's a new, re there's this, this reconfiguration proceeds, we get more clarity over who's in charge of what. And what eventually happens then is that it becomes institutionalized into these, you know, serious regulations that are actually public, right, that people can see. The other future, right, would be, and, and you know, I think that would be especially the case if, you know, we start to see a stabilization in US-China relations, the idea that investors are going to go back to China, then what everyone's really going to want is more accountability and transparency in that system. Whereas if we see more of a sense of threat, right, so Yelling's term is securitization, I completely agree with that perspective on it, then, you know, things may go more and more towards party control and party primacy, in which case, I think we would see investors even more reluctant to, you know, to kind of put their money there. Jenning, don't we have the answer to that? I mean, um, it's the latter, not the former, or or is there any doubt? Are you asking Yaling or me? Yaling. Oh. So, I think going back to this question of the coordination, right? So, the party does reach for these supra ministerial um, structures to overcome coordination problems, right? The silos, as Meg pointed out uh, earlier, were, were serious, were creating serious loopholes and leading to a lot of regulatory arbitrage and leading to um, massive ungoverned sectors. So when I think about whether or not this restructuring will work, one of the issue areas that I look back to as a comparison is the environmental sector, right, where the environment ministry for years had been extremely um, oh. ill-equipped, just did not have the authority to clean up, um, to enforce any of the environmental regulations that were great on paper, but just not enforced, partly because the actual authority for owner, in terms of ownership over resources, in terms of investment approvals, all of that was spread out over a number of different agencies. And in 2018, there was a big restructuring that concentrated a lot more authority within the uh, newly um, formed uh, Ministry of uh, Ecological Envi and, and Environment. Um, and when we look at where China is today in terms of the environment versus the past, right, there is a clear difference, right? There is a clear difference um, in the quality of the air and it is, um, it is taken seriously as a serious priority of, of the party, right? So we can say on the bright side, right, that the party has demonstrated in the environmental realm that if it wants to get something done, it can do so via its ability to launch these campaigns, via its ability to massively restructure the party state apparatus. Where the comparison falls short for me is that where the, in the environment sphere, the message was clear and simple, right? Clean it up. Whereas when it comes to financial governance, right, the message is we need to get all of these things done, right? We need to manage the risk. We need to promote innovation. We need to um, build the rule of law. We need to securitize. And how you coordinate um, all of the different actors to do that within the commission is still unclear to me because it's an, it's an there are built-in tensions to all of these priorities. Yeah. And um, with the emphasis on discipline, right? How do we also think about the risk aversion that emerges with the environment, right, when, when something is polluted, when the air quality is bad, it's visible, right? The monitoring challenge is not as large as compared to financial risks, which, which can be hidden. So in, in, in a way, that's a, that's a core of the matter, right? We, we have, 
Well, one, one remark on coordination, I remember the Financial Services Authority in the UK, which was kind of the functional equivalent to what we're talking about here. And in the end, they had such challenges of internal coordination that it made the whole thing explode and it ended pretty much in disaster. So, so I'm, I'm not sure that the fact of bringing everything under one authority resolves the coordination issue because you have coordination problems and prioritization right. pri prioritization problems, uh, sorry, uh, inside the, um, the sprawling organization. But let me come back to your point, yelling on uh, on what's the objective. Uday Das asked a question about, uh, isn't it simple, simply China taking a step back in terms of financial development, uh, moving towards a simpler utility-like financial sector that they can manage, which will be in a way, a step backwards in financial development, but more manageable in terms of financial stability. Do you feel that, and, and that would, on the face of it, um, chime with the fact that, you know, there is more party ownership of financial intermediaries, mm -hmm. uh, that there is uh, perhaps less sophisticated personnel in financial regulation. So we're kind of going back to the Middle Ages in terms of, uh, the, you know, uh, yeah. concept, but having maybe something more, more sturdy, more robust, more resilient. Does that make any sense or is that the wrong way to look at what what is happening? I love that question. And I think that that is one way to look at what's happening. And if you think about it, right, then, you know, there, it's really interesting because we might ask ourselves questions like, you know, why does China have a financial sector at all? Right. And in fact, maybe the anomaly is that in the last 20 years, we've seen this tremendous liberalization of the financial sector in a way that, you know, in terms of Yelling's, you know, comments on experimentalism, this is what they do. Right. And then it's a huge experiment to, to liberalize or democratize the financial sector. And it's failed. And so now they may go back to a place where we don't care about, you know, equity markets are not important. We don't even believe in credit. I mean, it's my personal view that they've never really thought of financial markets as a disciplinary source or as something that could be, um, you know, a, a, a self-governing independent area of China's economy. They kind of think of it as financial alchemy, right? You do a little bit of this, a little bit of this, and then maybe you can, you know, get some solutions that you want in terms of, you know, making SOEs more efficient or getting, you know, capital to innovation led sectors, right? But it may be that they're ending this experiment with financial liberalization, which would beg the question of how long will that last, right? Because then we're in a world where they still have these objectives of consumption and innovation driven growth. And then I would say a few years down the line, I mean, the history of authoritarian regimes with the financial system is this dance where they say, oh, we don't trust it. And then they crack down on it and, and shrink the size and use it as a more utility kind of thing in your commenter's language. But then they decide they need more economic growth and they liberalize it again, And at which point the same things happen. And so, I mean, I would just end on the idea. We, we have never seen a modern financial sector that efficiently allocates capital in a closed political system with the mild exception of Singapore, which I think is truly exceptional for so many reasons that are not replicable outside of an island state that can afford to pay people that much. That's, you know, such a small area with such different incentives. And so that would really be different if China is uh, able to do that. I, I don't want to, we're close to the hour and uh, Singapore, of course, is a town to you, Yeling. So maybe you want to comment <laughs> on it. Uh, but uh, um I don't want to finish the uh, hour without uh, talking about the uh, central banks. There's a question from Fernando Montes about this. Mm -hmm. um, the reform, uh, in many ways, is a demotion of the PBOC. The, mm -hmm. a, a lot of staff, if I understand correctly, is being transferred from the uh, provincial mm -hmm. and local offices of the PBOC to the new National Authority for Financial Regulation. Mm -hmm. um, what does that say about the role of the central bank in China? And is it correct to see it as a sidelining of the PBOC or is it more complicated? Maybe yelling first and then uh, make to conclude. Yeah, I think it's about 30 staff from the from the central PBOC that have been that have been transferred out. Um, and certainly in terms that's of at the political... central level, right? So that's the at the central the, level, yeah. Uh, and, and, and I was referring to the provincial level where my understanding, yes. but maybe wrongly, is that's that the, the yeah. amounts transferred are much greater. Mm -hmm. a, it's, a, it's a lot greater, just some background, because the county level PBOC uh, branches are being abolished. And then instead of these super provincial regional branches, um, every single province now will have a, have a PBOC um, uh, provincial level entity, right? So, and then there'll be vertical um, 
um, authority lines from the center to each of the provinces. So it's it's a big restructuring. Um, and uh, I think that is, again, an acknowledgement um, because they're restructuring it and an acknowledgement that the earlier system basically did not work, right? There's just too much localism and hidden information. Uh, and does that... I think a lot of people are reading what's happening at the central level as as a sidelining, right? And, and in part because the uh, head of the PBOC now is not on the central committee. So just in terms of formal political rank, the, uh, the head is outranked by um, the, the head is out the heads of China's state owned banks outrank the head of the PBOC, yeah. who is supposed to regulate the these bank, banks. Which is extraordinary. So that's a yeah. contradiction, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. I was going to make the same point. And just to close, maybe one last provocation, you know, the, the irony there is that the, 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 the CZP really wants the renminbi, right, to become a more credible international currency. But at the same time, still the independent- Or is that over? Well, I, I would argue it is a little bit over, but they still have in the long view. I mean, if you read a lot of what they're doing, right, I don't, I don't think they just seek to displace the dollar. I don't think any of that, right? But they do want it to become more credible in some ways, but that trades off and we're seeing that, right, with the desire for discretion and party state discretion over the financial and the monetary authorities within, within China. And so you're right, they've chosen discretion and party control over credibility, transparency, and internationalization. And that's the consequence, right? And so you can't have it both ways. And they're realizing that when they can't have it both ways, they choose security and party discipline over the other side of things. Um, so I, so it has implications also for how people internationally, I know one person asked, asked about the Belt and Road and all of those kind of things as well, right? And I think what we see now is a focus on getting the house in order domestically um, rather than those other goals, um, such as China as global financier. That was a question from Randy Henning. I also apologize yeah. to others who asked great questions and we didn't have time to address. But this was, um, to me, an incredibly uh, illuminating, stimulating, and also incredibly bleak session. So, uh, so <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the, picture, yes. the picture is much darker at the end of the hour, I guess, than uh, it was at least for me at the beginning. But, uh, but I, I've learned so much and I'm so grateful. So the next session uh, will be on February 21. We'll talk about climate change and banking prudential policies, both at the level of individual jurisdictions and at the global level with um, great experts, Martin Lubering from the University of Wellington in New Zealand and Sylvie Matera, an experienced professional of the field. Uh, in the meantime, thanks so much to uh, Meg Rismeyer and Yelling Tan for uh, uh, an, an incredibly intriguing <laughs> exploration of what's happening in Chinese financial regulation and supervision. And uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Yelling. Thank you, Nicholas. Thanks, <laughs>